pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel and Happy New Year. It's January 2nd in Tokyo. We're a day and a half, a day ahead or half a day ahead of most of the rest of you. So I'm on day two of 2018 and I couldn't wait till Friday Reads. So this video is going to be titled, I Couldn't Possibly Wait Until Friday Reads. Because I had such a wonderful day of reading yesterday and I, I just, even if I have nothing to say on Friday, I couldn't wait until Friday to tell you all this stuff. So let me natter on. I'm jet lagged up to my tits. Today, hopefully, will be a little better, but as I said, I don't go back to work until Monday, and I'm going to need that time to sort out my rhythms. So this is me at my most alert today. It's about 7 a.m., and I've been awake for a couple hours. Lots of people are putting up videos about their two 2018 reading plans, and I have none. How liberating is that? I've bored you all to tears with this before so let me just give it in one sentence for the last two years I did a whole bunch of reading challenges and those were my reading plans for the year aside from some other projects like reading the Mavis Gallant thousand page book of her short stories and uh, I'm still in the middle of reading the novels of Barbara Pym in sequence but other than that I had these year-long reading challenges and I'm done with those and I don't want to have any plans at all this year. So of course I have micro plans and I have secret plans but I'm not going to make videos about them or do a monthly plan like I used to. I really need to explore spontaneity and that's why I'm so excited to tell you about the day I had yesterday because boy was I spontaneous. I knew which book I was going to start the year with. That was in the back of my mind. I've had that. I made that decision several weeks ago but beyond that I just looked around here and it was almost like the opposite of the Marie Kondo technique. It was the books that sparked joy and interest that I pulled off the shelf or off my e-reader or whatnot. The only kind of spontaneous anti-plan that I had for 2018 was that I was really looking forward to just following along, for example, I think this month in January, the Tournament of Books gets going, and perhaps reading quite a bit of stuff that was on, on there, and then the Man Booker International Prize, and all the various literary prizes, and kind of stalking Peg on her channel, and reading along with her as much as I felt like. Well, I think I'm going to have to restrain myself a lot with that, for financial reasons. Kenji and I just have to really budget extremely tightly to do all the things that we're planning to do this year move in together and get married in August plus I have the added expense of renewing my work visa I'm going to after today cease all book buying for the foreseeable future so that probably means I can't really join in with the literary prize list read-alongs the way that I'd hoped but it's not impossible. I may be able to do a certain amount of it, but not not in any big way. In the meantime, I have this apartment overflowing with books that I haven't read, so I'll be okay. I will be totally fine. The TuneIn Premium Membership audiobooks will disappear on January 15th, so I am going to milk the last two weeks of their availability to the utmost. And I'll be talking about how yesterday's binge of new books is taking advantage of that. I'm going to keep Scribd. Thank God for Scribd. I've been a member of, of Scribd for about three years. And I haven't used it enough to really justify continuing with it. But now that I'm cutting off a lot of other sources of especially newer new titles, Scribd is going to be a godsend because... I pay about $10 a month, $12 a month maybe. They get a lot of new releases either in ebook or on audio. So I get three ebooks a month, three credits, and one audiobook per month. So that will be my sole source for audio for the foreseeable future. And lots of ebooks, including some new releases. So I'm going to be doing a lot of scribbed. 
Okay, so that's kind of background. So now, with all of that said, let me tell you about my fabulous day yesterday. I've had days like this. I used to have days like this to a lesser degree every month because as I mentioned in a previous Friday Reads, I think, I used to try to finish every book I started during the month by the end of the month. Did that for about a year so that the first day of the following month I would start a dozen new books on audio, ebook, physical book and it was always my favorite day of the month. Now I had a very organized TBR so it wasn't like a mystery about which books I would be beginning but it was still such a rich day of reading starting all this new stuff and then I re thought that I was becoming too neurotic about that so I relaxed it and I don't have those kind of days anymore but I did make an extra effort to finish all but one of the books that I had been reading at the end of 2017 by New Year's Eve so that I had an even bigger version of that yesterday New Year's Day I started reading I don't think I've even counted them but uh, you can count along with me during this video the only book that I didn't even attempt to finish from last year was this Polish novel The Doll by Bolislav Prus. I'm only about I was only about 10% into it enjoying it it was so rich but I just knew that there was no way I was gonna finish the 700 page novel by the end of the year so I just kinda put it on the shelf started I read a, another 2% of it yesterday and it's just wonderful I may try to finish it this month I don't care when I finish it when it's when a book is this rich I just take my sweet time but so, the book that I knew I was going to start on New Year's Day was the second book by the author who penned my favorite read of 2017, which was A Constellation of Vital Phenomena, and this is his second book, a collection of in interlinked short stories. Anthony Mara's The Tsar, how do, you, how do I show that? The Tsar of Love and Techno. This, I think, was from 2015. And, oh my god, I think it's going to be as good as his novel, his debut novel. This guy was just, is a born writer. I'm only about 15% or 10, 12% of the way into it, and I'm already feeling that same vibe. So, oh my god! The first story, Leopard, which I haven't finished, I got about 10 pages left. And like I say, they do seem like they all kind of link up together, like a short story cycle, so that's very interesting. It's also is set in the Soviet Union in the Stalinist 1930s. And the protagonist is a man named Roman, and he works for the Department of Party Propaganda and Agitation. And he's one of those technicians, those visual artists, who airbrushes out the people from the photos, and it turns out from the paintings because they've been shunned, they've been executed, they've been found ideologically wanting. And so you, everybody, I think most people know that that was what the Soviets did. They just took people out of pictures. I remember reading The Book of Laughter and Forgetting by Milan Kundera, where there's quite a bit of that in the novel, and I think it's fairly well known. But this is his vocation. And his brother took the uh, during the revolution uh, did not support the Bolsheviks the communists he was a very devout religious person so he was a rebel in the new regime and eventually he was arrested summar summarily tried and, and executed that's all information we find out in the first few pages the protagonist Roman he is a very devout Marxist very loyal to the state but he loved his brother and he is grieving and that causes him to rebel in a fascinating way so let me read the passage which shows what that little piece of very dangerous ideological and artistic rebellion is he's been given a painting with uh, upon which he is to insert the uh, an artistic representation of some party boss it's a very natural 19th century natural scene set in Chechnya. There's no people in it whatsoever, but the authorities have said, put this party boss in the picture. And he didn't want to do it, he didn't want to do it, and he finally does it. 
His brother, who is now, has been executed. His name is Vasca. When I painted in the toy soldier-sized party boss, I gave him Vasca's face, or what Vasca might have looked like had he grown into a bloated party bigwig. The best my profession can do is convert from image to memory, from light to shadow, but the brushstrokes I erased were repainted in me, and I realized that before I was a correction artist, a propaganda official, a Soviet citizen, before I was even a man, I was an afterlife for the images I had destroyed. That morning the last images of Vasca's face had been scratched into nothingness with a one-ruble coin. That afternoon I began painting him into everything. At first I was sure I'd be caught. In public buildings I'd passed corrected landscapes with the pulsing certainty that everyone recognized Vasca's face pinpointed into the background. No one did. It was just like that silly fairy tale I told my brother's son. He was safe in the background, beyond sight of those who would hurt him. I went on inserting him into every image I could, at every age even, or especially, Vasca as an old man. The ledger will never be righted, and Vasca's added to art will never make up for the Vasca subtracted from life. But the act of multiplying my brother, of seeing him again each day, seeing who he was and might have become, the idea that I may have finally become a portrait artist, makes the rest of the work bearable. I was never original enough to have my work shown in a cafe. Now my miniature portraits of Vasca hang everywhere. I'm told one has even made it into Stalin's living quarters. So yeah, this one is starting out uh, every bit as stunning as the, uh, a constellation of vital phenomena was. So I'm so excited! This one I am reading my book alongside the tune-in audio, and the audiobook is just wonderful. So I'm definitely going to finish this, or my plan is to finish this by January 15th before the audio vanishes into the ether. Here's another one that's been on my TBR for at least a couple years. And this one I first... Well, I remember when the writer died. It's Geek Love by Catherine Dunn. She died, what, a year and a half ago? She wasn't that old, maybe 60? I am not. I can't remember the details, but this is the only novel that of hers that everybody knows, the title, her most widely read novel, from 1983, I want to say. Read quite a bit about it when she died, and then one of the, I would say, the book podcast that played such a huge role in reawakening the reader in me is from Book Riot, uh, all the books, and one of the co-hosts, Liberty Hardy, this is one of her favorite books, and she talked about this book, and she talked about this book, and I thought, oh, I have to try this book, I have to try this book, and I hauled it last August, and I started it yesterday. I'm not going to read from it, but it is a wacky story. It's about a carnival, a family of carnival, the, the, the dad is the owner of the traveling carnival, and the carnival falls on hard times, and so he and his wife, a former trapeze artist, acrobatic artist, come up with a plan to have a bunch of kids for a freak show. So they do drugs, especially the mother. She does drugs and takes these various chemical concoctions and does cocaine and stuff to give birth, to produce these really physically interesting, these freakish children. Now that sounds horrible, but the way this is told with so much humor and so much love, I'm not judging them so far. I mean, what a horrible thing to do, but the way that she set it up, it's like, oh, what a nice family. <laughs> so geek love. Wow. I'm only a chapter in, but, uh, 
this one is is starting out just amazing so by the time i'd started that second novel yesterday i was just you know so jet lagged but i was really alert and drinking coffee and it was about five in the morning six in the morning and oh my god just a hum building in my body and just wow christmas morning and then i started this and i I only read the the prologue, which was like a page and a half, but what a stunning prologue. I talked about this on a, I believe it was a page 100, and, no, I think just a uh, 10 books tag or something, it doesn't matter, but I've talked about it once before, maybe on the five star prediction, maybe that's what it was. This was another one that Liberty Hardy raved about, and nobody else has talked about since then, except my really good friend who's the host of the wonderful book podcast, Reading Envy. Jenny read it and gave it five stars, but she, I have hundreds of friends on Goodreads, and Jenny's the only one that's read it, and Liberty's the only other person I've heard talk about it. The Loved Ones by Sonia Chung, a Korean-American novelist. It's kind of a sleeper, because nobody's talking about it or reading it, but the opening prologue set in Washington... DC in 1951 was very gripping and I love the prose so I'll just keep reading it it's about a african-american family fairly well-to-do african-american family who has a Korean nanny Korean-american nanny and all kinds of complications ensue that's all I know but it's from relegation books and it's one of those soft covers with the uh, French flaps is that what they're called that just feels wonderful in my hand and uh, I'm excited about this one so that was book number three on Scribd and this one I blame or thank Russell of Ink and Paper blog for this one because I watched several of his videos yesterday in and amongst all my reading and he included this next book on his most surprising reads of 2017 video I will try to remember to put a link to that video in the show notes. And I'd heard about this book before. It was already on my TBR, but he raved about it in a, in a way that I was particularly vulnerable to. And then he said it was kind of like John Williams' novel Stoner, which is one of my favorite novels ever. So then I was hooked, and I checked. Scribd had it, and I started reading it within five minutes of putting a comment on his page. And that is... After the Parade by Laurie Ostland, and it's a gay-themed novel, and I've read about a chapter and a half. I'm not sure if it's by chapters, but I've read just 20 pages or something. It's much more eventful than Stoner, but I certainly understand what Russell's saying so far, that it's kind of a meditative, calming, deeply introspective prose, but there's all this drama, so it opens with a 40-year-old gay man leaving his lover out that they've been together for I think two decades and he leaves quite suddenly and so far I don't know why he left him because it sounded like a very loving relationship and his first night in a motel <laughs> on his way to wherever he's going I think he's going to California he hears a terrible fight going on in the, the motel room next door he calls the staff and they and he breaks down the door before the police arrive and this man is beating his young son I don't know how young the boy is but he's a boy within an inch of his life so the boys rush to the hospital in a coma and the police come there's all this drama so that's and then the young woman the staff the who's on staff I think she's 18 or 19 she comes to this man this gay guy's a motel room the next night with beer and she's very upset about the attack but it seems like she wants something, sex or whatever, and it's really uncomfortable for the protagonist. So here is a quote about that, which shows you the meditative, uh, not meditative, but the, the depth of the prose and the depth of, of how the experience, which is quite, in a way, almost madcap, how it's represented. So this is the protagonist kind of trying to get rid of her in a gentle way because she's like he would didn't take a beer and he they're just sitting talking and it's very uncomfortable and so finally he says I need to go to bed he said and he stood up Britta stood also and picked up her beer 
leaving behind six wet circles on the desktop. He's in a coma, she announced as she paused in the doorway. Jacob, so you see, we might not have saved him. He might die anyway. Aaron leaned against the door frame, steadying himself. At least we gave him a chance, he said. Then, because he did not have it in him to offer more, he offered this. You're a good person, Britta, and that's important. They were standing so close that he could smell alcohol and ketchup on her breath. He imagined her sitting in a car in an empty parking lot somewhere in Needles with her boyfriend, Lex, the two of them eating french fries and drinking beer as she tried to tell Lex about Jacob while Lex rubbed his greasy lips across her breasts. Good night, Aaron said, gently now. He shut the door and pressed his ear to it, waiting to slide the chain into place, because he worried she might take the sound of it personally, though later he realized that she would not have thought the chain had anything to do with her. It was a feature of the room, something to be used, like the ice bucket or the small bars of soap in the bathroom. So that little passage, I think, is just stunning, especially that last bit about the the chain, the, the chain lock. Just so visceral. So I'm really looking forward to getting more into that one. So that one I'm doing just as an ebook on Scribd. And <laughs> the next one I decided to do on audio, because it's on TuneIn and it's a short one, I can certainly finish before the 15th, is my second Penelope Fitzgerald novel. This one's called The Bookshop. It was almost exactly a year ago, it was right at the end of 2016, that I read Offshore and loved it and found out this one was on audio. I liked the audio narrator. It's about five hours, six hour audio book. And then I found, because I was so enjoying the prose, that I thought there would be things I'd like to quote. So that I found that the ebook's on script. So I then I was doing it kind of as an audio text combo, but I'm going to try to keep it mostly audio. Anyway, it's about this middle-aged woman, I believe she's a widow, but I've kind of forgotten that already, who decides to open a bookshop in her small British town, and everybody thinks she's crazy, because why would you open a bookstore? We've never needed a bookstore all these decades, why would we need one now? So this is a, just a paragraph from, I think, page two, describing her, Florence. She was, in appearance, small, wispy, and wiry, somewhat insignificant from the front view, and totally so from the back. She was not much talked about, not even in Hardborough, where everyone could be seen coming over the wide distances, and everything seen was discussed. She made small, seasonal changes in what she wore. Everybody knew her winter coat, which was the kind that might just be made to last another year. So I can totally picture Florence from that. And the last one that I started on audio, and this one is without the benefit of any text, uh, e-text or e-book or otherwise, is an essay by Valeria Lucelli, the Mexican writer. I just picked up a, her novel in uh, the first part of my December haul, and then I found this essay called Tell Me How It Ends, an essay in 40 questions. I heard about it. And then I found it was like two and a half hours on audio. So I am I started it, and it's starting out really good, too. So it's an essay about her experience as a... I'm not even sure that she was a naturalized American when she had this experience, but she was, I believe, in the process of getting her green card. I'm sorry, I'm not really familiar with all the terms. But she was in, the, in that process when she started volunteering with... Uh, the tens of thousands of South American children that, that started coming into the uh, U.S. in about 2014, remember that? It was just uh, horrifying. It was just the way that they had been abused and, and the risks that they took riding on tops of the trains, getting through Mexico, and they were robbed and raped, and, and then they arrived in America, 
and weren't particularly welcomed. This is her essay about doing volunteer work, helping these young children fill out their immigration forms, their refugee application forms, and whatnot. Uh, finding it just fascinating. So, so that's one. And <laughs> can you see why I couldn't wait until Friday to tell you all about these? Remember this one? I did a page 112. I don't remember what it was. I did. I talked about this in a recent video. I believe it was a 10 books tag video. Because then uh, once I talked about it, I got more interested in it. And then I bought it, I think in November. And I started it yesterday. And what a sarcastic, mean protagonist. The mother. So it's about a young Soviet mo era mother in Russia. In the Tartar area of Russia. Which I'm not sure what that area is. Her teenage daughter gets pregnant. And she can't believe that her daughter got pregnant because she thinks her daughter's so ugly and why would any teenage boy or man touch her? So that's the kind of mother she is, right? But there's a biting humor to it that so far, I'm only a chapter in or something, uh, is really working for me. I may tire of her. But she tries to induce an abortion using all the folk abortion techniques and she there's no sense that her daughter has given her consent for this, but she's doing it for her own selfish reasons as well as she thinks her daughter, you know, wouldn't have much of a future as a teenage mom. So that's where I'm at, but it's kind of funny <laughs> as much as it's like, what a horrible <laughs> story. So who knows where I'll end up. This may be my first bail of the year, but right now I'm deeply intrigued by it. And so I thought, okay, Sean, enough, enough. But then I conked out at about 2 or 3 p.m. yesterday and slept off and on deep sleep that I didn't emerge from until about 10 p.m. and I did some stuff and did some stuff and ate and read some more decided to do one more because I had previewed the audio of this a few months ago when I hauled the book and loved it and the audio again is only about seven hours so that Sean you have to do this one before your tune-in audio books disappear and so I began this. A Girl is a Half-Formed Thing by Amar McBride. Doing this as a audio text combo and the the text is really difficult. I don't think I would be able to follow it without the audio, but the audio is narrated by McBride herself and it's just luscious and despite the absence of real any grammar in the text I could follow it I don't know if it's perfectly, but I felt that I was able to follow the narrative by reading and listening at the same time. I had an amazing reading day. This bodes well for 2018, even if I end up bailing on a, on a quarter of these, who cares? But I certainly had such a richly book maniacal day yesterday. I just couldn't wait until Friday to tell you about it. Thanks for watching.